Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joshua Gutu, and I work at OP Labs as a software engineer. Um, today, I'm going to talk about fault proofs on optimism, kind of give a high level overview of all of the different components, uh, run some brief examples, just kind of give an update on where we're at. Cool, so today's agenda, we're gonna go through the three main components of our fault-proof system. The fault-proof program, Canon, which is our fault-proof VM, the dispute game, which kind of ties it together. Then I'm gonna do some brief slides, maybe better viewed later, on Canon, running Canon in the Challenger, so we started to be able to run some of these components, and a brief information on how to stay up to date with all the work that we've been doing. Cool, so the fault-proof program. Um, so this is the thing that you actually have a dispute about, uh, and we're gonna be talking about the OP program, which is kind of the first fault-proof program, but we'll actually talk about some of the gen ways any program, not quite anyone, any program, but lots of programs could be kind of quote-unquote fault-proof programs. So generically, to be able to do a fault-proof over kind of program, you need to have some requirements. So this program needs to be deterministic, it needs to be seeded from information that only exists on L1. Um, and so kind of like with the L1 block hash opcode, then you can kind of get access to every single previous block hash. You can get access to all the historical state, but you need to kind of seed it from this hash. Uh, so if there's like an Oracle update on chain, you can pull that in, but it has to come through that update. Um, and then we also have kind of in the OP program, because it's an L2 chain, we feed in the L2 block hash, but that's from kind of finalized information on L1. Um, and then, so kind of going through like uh, this history and this provenance is you can fetch arbitrary information by hash as long as you're like kind of fine with it via the proofs. Um, then when you have this program, it's kind of emulated, uh, and then we have a host for it. Cool, so let's talk about the specific OP program. So what it does is it takes the derivation package from the OP node, and so this is what goes from L1 blocks to L2 block bodies, so that's like transactions uh, and kind of the list of transactions to be executed. Uh, and then we pull in the L2 execution from OP GIF, and that's kind of those block bodies to the final L2 state. So it kind of pulls everything all together and kind of wrap around already existing code. So whenever we make a change in the OP node or the OP GIF, it automatically gets pulled in. Um, and then we kind of go through Ethereum's pre-existing proof system, um, probably one of the few users of it, but it's all there and nice. Um, and then there's kind of technicality around what it actually does, which is verifying the output route as correct or not. Um, so it's a slight difference from the OP node program, which just kind of executes blocks, uh, but that makes it fit in with the proof system. And then lastly, there's this fun trick that I kind of hinted at is a block by number lookup uh, you can't actually do in this environment because you don't really have a proof on it. Um, but you can kind of convert it into a block by hash lookup by walking back the chain. Uh, so there's a couple sneaky things like that where we have to intercept calls and turn one type of call into another. Cool, so that's the fault proof program that runs inside Canon. And so let's go through a high level overview of the fault proof VM and Canon. So Canon is a bunch of things kind of wrapped up in one. It's a MIPS interpreter, and we kind of have an on-chain version, and we have an off-chain version. Um, the on-chain version kind of has to have all of these state, uh, it's deterministic, so it needs to have state, and it doesn't touch the network. The off-chain version, you can run it in a mode similar to on-chain, but there's also a mode where it fetches pre-images. Uh, so if you, inside the, OP program, you say, I need this L1 block to grab all the transactions from it. It does a lookup by hash, and that's the block body is the pre-image for the block hash, uh, so it needs to go fetch that data from an L1 RPC somewhere. Um, and then kind of there's this off-chain component of step generation, and then this last on-chain component is only ever actually executing a single MIPS instruction. Um, so it's not executing the entire history of the program, just this one cheap instruction. Um, and so what it is, it's Go code that runs an EVM, that's your uh, geth on L1, 
emulating a MIPS machine, that's your contract, running compiled Go code that runs an EVM, that's your L2 geth. Uh, and so you could go recurse this more and more if you wanted to. Cool, so that's a high level overview. Now let's talk about a single instruction step. This is the core of Canon, which is all of like the individual instructions of your program. So every program is composed up of billions of very simple instructions. So like adding two numbers together, shifting a number, loading something from memory, writing something to memory. And so this is just example. Um, we're adding the contents of registers one and two and then storing them into two. We have our step number, which is kind of where it is in this trace. And then our program counter is kind of what the next instruction should be. And then we have our registers. Um, and this is actually kind of what happens on chain is we have contracts that does the single instruction. Um, then kind of off chain, we have to do all of these instructions basically, because your several gigahertz processor is doing several billion instructions per second. Um, and so over the entire course of the program, we have this huge instruction trace. So the instruction trace is just all of these steps combined together. Um, and then what we do is we go get that information at specific points and we do a bisection over this instruction trace. That's kind of the core of the dispute game and what lets us scale uh, really easily uh, is because we can have a very long instruction chase but have a relatively small kind of number of rounds on chain and so we're not doing all of this computation on chain. Cool, so that's kind of the instruction trace in Canon. So we have these two components. We go from our fault proof program to Canon. We have the instruction trace and then we have to do the bisection game on chain and kind of figure out like what's actually true or not. Um, so kind of the high level setup of the game is that there's an output proposer which says, okay, I think the end state of the L2 system is this, and then the dispute game kind of says, I think that's wrong. Um, and so you can initialize it with a commitment to the very last state of that trace, um, so kind of like say Canon has said this is true or not. Um, and then that's kind of the trace you're disputing over. And then there's also kind of a fixed depth uh, to this game, which actually means you kind of have a fixed instruction length. That's kind of a side note of then you have to do some padding. Um, so a little bit of details, but that's kind of the initial setup. So now we actually play the game and we kind of have this set of rules that we go through uh, to kind of do this bisection. So we, we kind of say every claim disagrees with its parents, we, and so that means every kind of, all the even levels agree with each other, and then all the odd levels agree with each other. Uh, and then we kind of either go left in this trace, which is uh, attacking, or we go right in this trace, which we call defending, um, based on whether we agree with the claim value. And so we're trying to bisect uh, to the instruction point where the divergence uh, in the traces happened. Um, so kind of an example of this is like, if someone thinks one thing happened and someone else thinks another thing happened, where is the first instruction where those diverged? Um, yeah, and then each claim is doing this narrowing. So let's kind of quickly go through this example. So we're gonna have two traces, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, E, X, Y, Z. Uh, so those are just stand, the letters are just stand-ins for hashes. So well, the top one's gonna be green and the bottom one's gonna be blue. And we're gonna go through kind of each claim and what that looks like. So kind of Z is the initial claim uh, put out on chain. Um, then green attacks with D, kind of narrowing it. Then you defend with X, again narrowing it and doing this bisection. Then we attacked E again. And so we're kind of this final state, right? the letters or hashes are right next to each other, so we're gonna ask, is E to X a valid state transition? Um, and the answer is no, and so kind of for the dispute resolution games, we're just gonna add on this extra claim. So this is kind of what we do, is like we have these countering claims, and that this very last thing, this step, that's your single instruction on Canon. You load in the pre-state and you say, D, uh, did the post state that we're going to, did that actually, is that valid or not? Um, cool, uh, and so then with this resolution is we have all of these claims, we've ran our canon, so then we actually have to kind of go back up and say, are, do we agree with a root claim or not? Uh, 
And so we kind of have this rule, we find the leftmost uncontested claim, and then we assume that it's true. The leftmost claim really pops up when there's like multiple actors playing this game, because that's kind of allowed. Uh, and then we assume it's true, because otherwise it would have been countered. Uh, and if there's no uncontested claims, because like we said, we hey, a step failed, then we default to the roots being true. Um, and then the step is really only about like, for this final leaf claim and has slightly more complicated rules. So that's kind of a brief overview of the dispute game and how we kind of tie it back up to the root. Cool, so now we have all of these components. We compile the core derivation function, the OP program to MIPS, which is now our fault-proof program. We generate the instruction chase with our fault-proof VM. We bisect it uh, with the dispute game. We run this single instruction step with Canon, and then we can keep or removed outputs depending on the results. So with this, we can remove outputs that are invalid, or if there's a malicious actor who's trying to remove a valid uh, output or state commitment, we can say, no, this is actually correct, and we're going to leave it. Cool. Um, yeah, we can tie it all together. And then there's kind of one last critical thing, um, which is very exciting for me, and as kind of we go down this modularity roadmap uh, with kind of the OP stack, is we can work with different clients or different fault-proof VMs even, right? So right now, we're working just with the OP node and OP geth, which kind of get imported to OP program, and it's just canon. Um, but with OP ref and some other kind of potential Rust uh, L OP clients, you can take Rust and then you can compile it to Canon. So now you have two, uh, two different fault proof systems, two different clients, and it's very easy to kind of interchange it. We're not changing the dispute game, we're not changing Canon, it just kind of works. Uh, the other thing is now you can create a new uh, fault proof VM. Uh, so we have kind of some ideas in the works. Uh, there's kind of both kind of with a different type of VM as well as doing like potentially some ZK. So there's this risk zero idea floating around, or risk zero the team kind of thinking about uh, some ideas with like let's do a risk five uh, ZK EVM. And so now you have a ZK EVM that plugs into that last step and then kind of it all uh, bubbles up. Uh, so the modularity is a very big component of this. Cool, so now we have all of the components, let's start running them. Um, so this is a very long thing that I don't probably expect you all to get exactly at this moment, but you can go into the monorepo slash canon folder um, and kind of start playing around with it already. And here it's working on Gurley and it's creating some state outputs and some state commitments every 100 steps and it's only doing 400, but you can run it much, much longer. Um, and then kind of on the OP Challenger, which is the component that plays the dispute game that we just worked, uh, you just go into the OP Challenger folder and kind of create the game and then you can run two different copies of the agents kind of attacking each other and then there's a way to visualize it at the end. Cool, so that's kind of where we're at currently. Um, now let's talk about some ways to keep up to date with everything. So the two places kind of have the most digestible information is our dev blog and our OP Labs Twitter. Um, we're talking a lot about this um, and we're gonna have more information coming up, coming out about this dispute game and that's kind of as we get to more milestones, that's kind of where those be announced. And if you're really interested in the technical details, uh, everything is in public on Twitter, or on GitHub, so github.com slash ethereum dash optimism slash optimism, that's our primary repository, that's where Canon is, uh, that's where the challenger is, that's where our fault game contracts is, we're working in public, so um, wanna follow along and wanna help out, we're always happy. Cool. So that's kind of high level overview of fault proofs. I'm Joshua, I'm at OP Labs. Uh, I think we're close to time, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for the talk. Um, I just wondered uh, how do you uh, store um, how do you manage to store the layer two states? Uh, do you use precompiles or uh, how do you do this? Uh, kind of inside Canon? Yes. Um, so you have to call out to an archive node and we basically do, when we're doing the execution, we do a, an MPT proof against the state. 
uh, and that gets loaded into a pre-image. Um. So during the, the time that the transaction can be replayed, f from where, from an archive node, like uh, Optimism layer two node, you you take the this data, I don't know. Yeah, so initially that's, yeah, all the transactions are L on L1. We have the transaction data and then we're simulating it and then we call out into state, if that makes sense. I can also try and explain it afterwards. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one in green back there. Hi, hello, thank you. Uh, uh, if I understood correctly, this is like a strong optimization of the dispute game itself. Uh, but I thought that um, this would not be like um, mandatory since fault proofs should be should appear quite rarely. So nobody should actually submit uh, faulty blocks because of the incentive game behind it. Yep. It was was it really a need to optimize it that much, or is it to prevent the denial of service attacks? Maybe uh, in the, in terms of like doing the bisection. Uh, yes, I mean going uh, uh, instead of just you know like um, uh, disputing the whole block and saying yeah execute it completely again because uh, I believe this, this block is uh, is wrong. Yes, that is a necessary optimization. Um, there's some tricky things with if you do that. Loading the data for that block becomes really tricky. It becomes very gas intensive, um, and kind of without without doing the bisection architecture, uh, it just becomes so difficult to do a good fault proof and keep it up to date um, that it's basically like kind of not worth doing. To okay. Degree. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Last question. Okay, thank you Joshua, thank you everybody.